The voice in your ears is Perfect Purpose, and this is the offseason. So today, we're going to talk about tackling in football. It's a topic that's dear to my heart. I'm an old school guy, if you think about it football-wise. I come from a, a town where the running back is the most popular and most important position. So we know we know all about tackling and getting hit a lot. And now that we're, what, we're recording this in 2022, probably won't release until 2023. <laughs> But we're in the, the age of, you know, no fun league is what they're calling, you know, the NFL type of stuff because you can't hit people. You can't make tackles and people getting hurt trying to get tackled. And I'm rambling on my intro, but you need to know that I have a guest here with me. It's not going to be just me talking. Wojciech, I don't like to do the intros. I want you to tell the people who you are, how you're involved with football and what you want to get accomplished on this show today. Yes, sir. My name is Wojciech Andrzejczak. Thank you for having me, Purvis. Right now, I'm the defensive coordinator for the Ravensburg Razorbacks in GFL1. I also have been working this past season as analyst for Atavis. I've been involved in, in shoulder tackling in, um, well, since 2017, when we actually implemented some of that USA football terminology. I mean, I've, I've been working with them for quite some time now. And as Purvis said, you know, I'm the, I was the first generation of players in Poland when we started in 2005. So I have my memories of how we were introduced to the game of football, you know, how we were tackling and, you know, how I was, when I transitioned to coaching almost a decade ago, you know, how I was teaching it to my players. And uh, I hope we have a great discussion today. I hope we can um, share some knowledge, you know, maybe debunk some myths and hopefully you'll find some of those ideas useful and, you know, you, you'll be able to implement, you know, at your, at your clubs or your teams. Yeah, that's, that's what this is all about. It's really pr putting up information you know, experts and coaches and people who know football, there's there's always more than one way to do something. That's just, it is what it is. But this is a topic that we feel like a lot of people might not understand that there's more ways. So we're going to try to, you know, give you some of those and talk about what we prefer as well. So first thing I want to talk about before we even get into the actual tackling is why do we want to discuss this topic? I'm going to go from my personal point of view. The reason I brought this up about tackling in football and Boychek knows this. I put something up on Facebook a while back about tackling. I don't even remember what I put up, but I do know that my stance hasn't changed, that people don't put in the time to learn how to tackle. And doing drills that are controlled environment tackling is great for technique in theory. But you also, you, when we're watching football, when I'm watching guys play, I can tell guys who have been tackling and guys who have Maybe they've done the drill, but the game is totally different. And in practice, they're doing thud, or if you touch somebody, they're down, and you don't go through the full tackling motions. And, of course, you know, the way that society is now, it's all about, you know, preventing injuries. We don't want people to get hurt. I will say this, and I probably will say this a couple more times in this podcast episode. If you tackle correctly, you don't get hurt, and the person you tackle don't get hurt. Like, it's just, it's a fact. Obviously, injuries happen and there's ways to get hurt eventually. But me, myself, I was always a small player, a defensive back, never got injured making a tackle. Never actually got injured getting tackled, if I really want to think about it. All my injuries came from fluke randomness of me, like, moving too much myself. But again, the thing comes that people are afraid that, oh, players are going to get hurt in practice because they're tackling. They're more likely to get hurt in the game because they're put in a situation they haven't seen before you learn how to get tackled by getting tackled if i've never been hit when i get in the game i get hit and i don't know how to fall and i fall on my ankle or my knee instead of rolling on my back and knowing how to fall or if i get in a dog pile i've never been in a dog pile so i don't know that hey someone's gonna try to grab your nuts I mean, that's just what it is what it is a defensive lineman is gonna try to grab your nuts or put the hand in your booty so you gotta clinch everything hold the ball and stop trying to fight for extra yards, or you might get some pulled or torn, you know? You get poked in the eyes underneath dog piles. You don't know that in a practice, because no one's going to do that to you in a practice, obviously. But when it comes to tackling, a lot of tackling that we see in games, we see people miss tackles and we're like, oh, that player's not that good. He just missed a tackle. Well, why do you think he missed a tackle? He didn't put in the 10,000 hours. And that's why I want to discuss the topic. I feel that people are underestimating how hard and how difficult tackling is. And then in game situations, 
they're not giving credit to the people that are making the people miss the tackles because they're saying people don't know how to tackle. Well, that's because they're not putting in hours. So I'm not going to discredit someone. If, if he can't tackle, that's him. But also, it does make things harder if people would learn how to tackle. So that's why I want to talk about it. Before you check, what, what's some of the reasons you wanted to jump on this? Because you, we made sure, I made sure that me and you would talk about this because we've been messaging on Facebook and stuff. So I wanted you to, you know, have this to yourself. But what's what's the reason why you want to talk about this? Well, I actually scrolled down through those Facebook messages and you said it like, all those donuts are great, but like, you know, the best way to learn how to tackle is actually tackling. And, and as you say, there is a fine line between keeping your players fresh and having those live reps. And I, and I, and I think you hit the nail on the head. It, even if I'm the defender, you're, you're the running back. The enemy has a vote. You're, you're being taught to break the rules that I have to, you have, you've been coached to beat me. And, and as you say, it's that one on one battle. And as you say, it's, it's finding that balance, that sweet spot. And I think that's why football is so awesome is that it's not black and white. And we live in a lot of shades of gray. You know, we're going to talk about youth players or, you know, we're going to talk about the veteran players. And as you say, part of having those solutions and and those medicine is finding the problems. Why certain player missed the tackle? Especially if you, you know, if you go against the guy, if I'm a local dude and, and we're talking about Europe now, and I go against the guy who played Division One has the A in the back of a head, there was a huge, you know, athleticism mismatch. And even though I maybe, you know, talked with the latest and the best terminology and all the latest, you know, techniques, you may still beat me. But the, the, the whole name of the game for me as a defensive coach or as a defensive player is to improve my odds. And I think, you know, there is the safety aspect of it that, that we've discussed or, or that we said, okay, you know, yeah. and then performance, yeah. right? Recently, you know, the, the company that I work out of is they've, you know, um, released a study that y- yards after contact can amass to 30% of total yards given up by the defense. And actually, I did some studies myself within my previous teams and it'd be between 20 to 30%. Think about the number, right? Whether it's you give up 300 yards or 200 yards a game, you know, that's one third of it to, to, to one fifth. I want to yeah. jump in about that, about the, the yards after contact. You know, me, my, my background is playing running back. We were always taught, you know, make the first man miss. And that's yards after contact. And I, I also think just, again, I'm always going to talk about the society we're in now and how football has become so soft. Like, that's really the issue here. But also now you don't see that as much. Like, guys, the making the first guy miss isn't something that's focused on. It's not something that's practiced. Like, if a play doesn't work and you get tackled by the first guy, that's not the play's fault. It's the player's fault. You're not supposed to get tackled by the first guy. But also defensively, you're supposed to make that tackle. And it, it depends on where it is, you know, open field in the hold are two different situations. But at the same time, I feel like it's not something that's practiced. Like we don't practice making that first guy miss. We practice, oh, it's a tackle drill with no real situation or consequence. Um, if you go to college, you'll watch running backs and linebackers. The linebacker will be on the, I think, on the goal line. And then the running back is five yards away and you got to score even though you're at a five yard disadvantage and a defensive linebacker, if he doesn't, if he does let him score, you know, there's a penalty for that. Like you have to do something. There has to be a, a reward and a consequence type situation. I think that doesn't happen enough. Like if, if I can piggyback on what you just said is that one key aspect for us and, you know, with the Razorbacks, we've been kind of having our four, four week cycle, the off season cycle is that teaching those guys, especially when we go defense on defense and you become the quote unquote offensive player, you want to have that running back mentality. You want to score. You want to embarrass the defensive player because, as you said, if if the guys are just coasting through, I'm not preparing you for game day. I'm not preparing you for that stress. And as you say, whether it's that famous, you know, box drill where you have the toss and there is like a 10 or 10 or 7 on 7 yards and then you have a, you know, this juke move or whatever you see those in the, you know, Nike camps or whatever camps. If you think about it, like in soccer or basketball, right, you play one-on-one all the time. All the like, time. Remember Allen Iverson, like here for us, you may have those, you know, one-on-one DB receiver drill with catching, but as you say, that one-on-one battle or that preparation phase of a tackle where I close that gap, where I close the distance, and I'm like, there's like one or two yards between us. And can you can you win? Can you make me, you know, fall my ass? Or I don't know if you saw that clip of Saquon Barkley against Washington, right? When he literally, you know, he makes the juke move and then that, that linebacker, falls onto his ass. Like, yeah, how yeah. do you prepare a defender for this? 
you know how do you can you replicate those conditions in a competitive drills or small sided games to where you know you have to make the decision making drill and it's not only you know technical right where you have predetermined you know winner or, or the, the ball carrier has a predetermined path um, the reaction the reaction part is the biggest thing is that you <laughs> You can practice, you know, drills and you can even do, you know, inside drill, which is still limiting because everybody knows where the ball is going and how it's going to react compared to in the game where the running back isn't the guy you practice against. And what you see is that players who have, I guess, played and I'm saying this in quotations, you can't see it, but if they've played more games, that's in quotations, they're better at tackling. And then that leads people to say, you know, well, you just got to play more games. Uh, yes and no. You got to play more scenarios. And that's the issue is that if you keep practicing the same scenarios and you only do a couple, then your your repetitions are limited. And this is why we have to try to enforce more game type situations, which is tackling, which is yeah. imaging, which is playing against each other and putting each other in different situations more often than just we're going to do this drill because we always do this drill and this drill supposedly is good, especially when it comes to tackling. And I, I, I feel like we're, we're going to try to keep this episode semi short, but we're all obviously into it. So I'm going to try to move us to a new topic. We're going to talk about youth players. And when we get into these youth players, uh, both in the States and in Europe, youth players is where football starts. And the difference um, immediately would be that, you know, in the United States, most players start playing around six, seven years old in Pee Wee and Little Leagues all across the country. While here in Europe, most kids don't get into it until they're about 15, even 16, 17 year olds. You have some guys don't start playing until they're adults, obviously. But if we stick to the youth, most teams, if a good, a good youth program will get players around 13, 14 years old, an average youth program gets 15, 16 year olds kids that aren't playing other sports anymore, stuff like that. And in the United States, you're comparing that to someone who started when they were eight. So you have a, a six to seven year advantage in the USA when it comes to the the tackling and coaching techniques. And I'm putting them both together because we're, you know, both sides of the water nowadays. But in the USA, Little League coaches, they're not great. I'm just going to put it out there. They're, they're not any better than what a European coach would be for Little League, for, for juniors. But the biggest difference is six or seven years of, you know, reps, even if they're not great reps or even getting coached great, players have time to figure out their mistakes. They learn slower. They have time to figure out, okay, this is how I need to tackle. And you have all those reps compared to a 15-year-old here in Europe who in three or four years, you're going to be playing against men. And you don't really have the time to figure out how to tackle so immediately how you're taught from day one is going to lead you to what you're going to do. And you'll see a lot of players end up quitting the sport because, oh, football is too dangerous. It, you put a helmet and shoulder pads on a 15-year-old, what is he going to do? He's going to use the helmet and shoulder pads. I mean, why not? That's what he's going to use. Go ahead. Yeah, I had an interesting experience of that. Like, um, we, we work with a certain school down in the, in our region in Germany, and mm-hmm. I had ten to twelve year olds. And you know, I go there, and coach says, "Yeah, we're gonna do a little bit of like flag football." And I'm like, uh, he's bringing the shields. I'm like, hey, "How about we do some tackling?" And these kids are ten to twelve, and I just and then we have those mats. You know, that's it's not like it's very uncommon to have them in the states and, and even in Europe, right? They have yeah. those big mats. I said, okay, let's try some tackling. And so like one step, you know, you live with your, your foot and your shoulder, one step, and all those kids get into it. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, with the ski jumping, you know, that's why they started so early. And, you know, you, you, I'm in Poland, you're in Finland, like these guys are not afraid. They don't know they are afraid. Like those kids, naturally, you give them, sh- you give them shield. And I think that's the critical point. You got to show them the correct technique of tackling. And it's, so much easier to teach somebody who has never played football than yes. unlearn or unteach the, the bad habits because in the drill, the guy may, you know, he may do the, the correct technique and then in the game, he may revert to those bad habits or he may, you know, what's even worse, he, his confidence, like, may be messed up. It's like, okay, what do I do now? Where's my, oh, should I go with my head or should I go, you know, which shoulder or, you know, what do I do? So I would say it comes down to coaches' education and, and you know, the you know, USA football has been putting the, the materials out there, you know, the Adavas and other authorities have been, you know, teaching and it's actually 
Um, when you hear Rocky Sato, who was the original assistant for Pete Carroll, even in his USC days, the guy who made credit with, you know, introducing the rugby tackle into American football, like he said that they, they actually spoke with players that played in the 60s and 70s, and mm -hmm. they were told that rugby style because there was no face mask. It was when the face mask was introduced, then as you say, then they said, okay, let's use the, the helmet as a weapon, let's use the head across the bow. It's kind of like time is a flat circle, and we're kind of coming back to the to the beginning of football. And as you say, there is the, also the evolution of the offensive football, the basketball on grass, when they try to defend you, you know, all the 53 yards, or yeah. like the, it's the, constantly the evolving. Yeah, the game is the constantly league, evolving. Whenever you have the small three, but you have seven on seven, the biggest thing, or like when I was coaching the nine man ball in Poland, 95% of our missed tackles, we couldn't get to the player at the proper angle because you got to close so much space and the guy's coaching. Oh my God, you have a blockers. Oh my God, you have. Yeah, you gotta, that, that's what reminds me of, um, again, going back to my anecdotes. This is my show, so I can talk about my, my stuff now. Yeah, but. Sure. Going back to like how it's done in the States, a lot of kids, you start playing like flag football and flag football, you're not tackling. So it takes your your helmet and shoulder pads out of it and you have to go grab flags at someone's waist, which gives you an aiming point. And the angles you learn playing flag as a kid, as you get older, those angles just they just multiply. It's the same angle, except now I can get a little closer and I have to wrap up instead of grab for a flag, which is actually easier, but I'm, I've learned the angles of where to go. And you still have very similar angles to when it running and, and finding closing gaps and things like that. But also we have these eight and 10 year olds playing football. They're not moving very fast. They physically can't. So the angles are going at their speed and they're still learning the same angles. While once a kid is 15 years old, I mean, when I was 15, I was running a 4.5. Like, that, that's how it happens. I went from running a 4.9 as a 14-year-old to a 4.5. Like, it happens just like that. Now, imagine someone who doesn't play football until they're 15, and they're thrown into this very fast-moving sport, and they've never learned the angles. They've never seen them slowly, and they haven't learned how to get to the right position. Because these 10-year-olds, these they don't know how to tackle. But they're still learning angles, and it's not hurting anybody. Even with helmet and shoulder pads, when they have a collision, everybody laughs because that's about it. Like, you're not worried about concussion. But by the time they turn 15, now you're like, if someone doesn't know what they're doing out there, they can be hurt. Which well, and, and yeah, I think go ahead. coming back to what you said about playing other sports, because you can find uh, an exception to the rule, but yeah. you don't know the players who haven't played football until they're like, 21 or what's the name, David Ojagbo, right? Or like the other kid who started playing football in in, uh, in high school in the States and now he's in the league, but mm -hmm. he's a British athlete. And as you say, if you, you know, played rugby or if you even play soccer or hockey, right? Or different sports and you have that body awareness, you know, like, okay, it's, it's similar or I can translate to this, right? You still have to teach them the techniques, but like, as you say, it's, there is a learning curve and there is the level of physicality um, that they have to adapt. And uh, yeah, yeah, and there's a there's a big difference when you're speaking, and I'm just adding on to what you're saying. When you're talking about people that don't play football, there's a difference between someone who has played an athletic sport and then someone who hasn't played sports. Like yeah. someone who comes from soccer, baseball, basketball, you put them on a football field, yeah, they're going to be able to figure stuff out. Technique-wise, they can still be raw, but technique can be learned. But if you get someone who has like never played sports, They've only played in gym class and put that person into a football team, they're probably going to end up quitting because there's just too many things that they can't figure out on the fly. A basketball player can learn angles. A soccer player has to know about angles. You know, even a baseball player knows how to track a ball, something in Europe that because baseball isn't really a sport here, defensive backs aren't that great at um, ball in the air drills. If I'm not mistaken, like I've seen that a lot here in Finland, because there's no there's no sport where you see a ball in the air and track it. Well, what about handball? Handball is a pretty physical sport. I don't know how how it's in Finland, but it's like you know, it's like yeah, that's a pretty good sport. I, also, I think that's why German and Poland defensive backs might have a little bit of an advantage on some other countries. I won't put that out there right now, but it, it's one of those things. Um, just agreeing to what you say, like playing multiple sports that can supplement you playing football. And coming obviously. back, to, we haven't to something that we haven't said is that. You know, as you say, let's just take that youth soccer player who plays 30 games, let's just say in the season, even at that age, and they may have 
let's just say 60 practices, right, for in, in a year or whatever. For American football, you may have six games, 10 games, and that's max. And how many practices you have? And you say it's a, it's a one of the few sports where you have five to six practices or even more to one game. And, or like, you know, that, that's, that's what you said, is that in the off season you want to incorporate those, you know, maybe some grappling elements we haven't talked about, right? Because you may be able to bench press 150 kilograms or deadlift, you know, whatever, but you have to be able to move another person against his will. And there is like, yes, nothing prepares you more for playing football than playing football, but you got to find some substitutes or something that is close to it. Like we we um we incorporate like gut wrench, right? Like um, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I'm not trying to, to teach my guys to be professional wrestlers, but you know, executing a um a, you know a, a gut wrench on an 80 or, or 100 kilograms guy, even if he's kneeling, it's a little it's a little closer to executing a roll tackle on a on a running back than doing a roll on a non weighted bag. And as you I'm say, just you I'm gonna jump in there just just to kind of even. I, again, we're still agreeing on damn near everything. But when it comes to like doing these multiple sports, I think some people think that we might be saying, you know, multiple sports and it'll help you. Yeah, of course it will. But the reason that it will help you is because football is such a changing sport. Things change so much. If you only learn certain things, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning, if you only do drills for football, when you get in the game and someone does something different, what are you going to do? You can't adjust. If you if you have a wrestling background, sometimes it's just about effort. You get in the game, you get overpowered, but your wrestling technique kicks in and you adjust and you don't lose a block because the guy doesn't move that you've never seen in practice, but your wrestling kicks in and you adjust and that's it. There's no, And you don't have to worry about that. And also, just one more thing I've seen in Europe that I didn't even know was a thing until I started watching basketball here in Finland, overtraining. Because kids are playing one sport all year and they're doing repetitive moves. Doing multiple sports also prevents that because me throwing a baseball isn't the same as me throwing a football, but it does strengthen my my arm and my my torso similarly. I still gain strength even though I'm doing different motion in the same areas. You know, me playing basketball works on my explosion differently than in football, but it still gives me explosion. And what it does, yeah, it doesn't overtrain my muscles. If I can piggyback on that is sometimes because we run into that in like this year in spring when I was in Switzerland, a lot of those club coaches are very protective and like they oh feel my like God, oh my God, true. if that uh and because we had like a hockey team and I said, Okay, uh, why don't you come and play football with us? Well, I play hockey. Yeah, but you play hockey in the in, in, in the winter when you finish. Oh, we finish in March. Exactly. We start in, you know, in, in, in April or May. So you have something that is slightly different that's still a um a different sport but it can it can help you with your hockey like we yeah. had one kid actually who played who played soccer who was a goalie and his coach was actually he didn't make you know he played american football for us like that kid ended up winning two championships in one day he played d-line for us on sunday at i think it was like the game started 11 and then he had like soccer game at like as a goalkeeper right at like 3 p.m so like I'm not saying that okay you play multiple sports you're gonna win championships and, and all of those but as you say there are benefits to it and you know definitely overtraining or or you know overexposure is is, is one of them diminishing yeah. the risk of and, and burnout because like yeah. kids are quitting sports these days yeah. right the kids do not want to practice four to six times a week that's again the society we live in they do not want to practice four to six times a week and then the same sport all year long. I don't know if I've said this on another show or something, but I'm, I guess I'm going to repeat it here is that sports clubs should work together. Multiple sports clubs should work together, but everybody sees these kids as, you know, that's how you build your club or that's how you make your money or that's your client. And people want to keep that to themselves when your player can probably develop much better by playing multiple sports and even football players. And this is something that some of these football coaches out here don't want to hear, but in the off season, you do not have to give your kids, and again, we're still talking youth, you do not have to give your kids a rigorous, complete off-season program where they're lifting, working out, playing football, and going through all this different stuff like they're in college. First of all, they're not in college, so don't why compare it to that as a kid. Second of all, no one in high school does that. Most high school players, um, their off-season programs are not very difficult. It's one or two times a week 
you go in and get an extra lift or a workout, and then you have a gym class that's technically your football class where you don't really do football. The offseason isn't football. You're doing these like athletic movements and stuff because you're trying not to overtrain. And then depending on where you're from, like I'm from Texas, we have spring ball where you get a month of all of a sudden we're back in football season and then that shit's kaput. But in Europe, you got guys who are running youth programs saying, okay, we're going to hit the gym two to three times a week. We're going to have two practices. We're still wearing helmets and pads and we're going to do athletic stuff and try to get you in shape. And these kids are like, I just played all summer. First of all, I lost my summer playing football, which that's got to suck. I lost a little bit of my fall and now it's like winter time and I'm in here doing this sport every day. You're going to get burnt out. Well, same thing with the other sports is they don't want to do those sports all year long either. Give your kids a couple months off. Tell them to go play. I don't know what sports they could play, but handball, basketball, soccer, even ice hockey. Go, go play it. Have fun. Let your body readjust and let it also learn new things. You know, one sport that I like to play is badminton. I know it's not that athletic of a sport, but it, it works on concentration that I don't, I've never used before. So it, it helps my cognitive abilities as well as my athleticism in different areas. And that's the type of stuff that you want these kids to do. But obviously you want them to, you know, get stronger, hit the gym, but also to a certain point, like most teenagers, their body's going to let them know what they can do physically. So you don't have to push it like, hey, you got to be in the gym this many days. I was a late bloomer. Uh, by the time I was 19, I could barely bench press 225. By the end of my college career, I could do 20 reps at my pro day. Like, it, it changes for everybody. But I, just, I really just want people that are, if you're running a youth program, just remember, you don't have to control these kids in all season. That's another thing. Like, coaches want to, well, I want to make sure I know what they're doing and how they're doing. They're kids. Everybody's going to develop different. If they want it, they're going to do what they need to do. If they well, don't want it, don't pressure them so maybe they can help your team. And as you as you said, you know that's why, like, I wouldn't say push it, but I think it's important to develop those small sided games to where, mm -hmm. let's just say, for adult players, I would say, okay, it's a two man vice drill. For the younger guys, I may say, hey, it's uh, sorry, wolves and rabbit, right? Yeah, there you catch go. the rabbit, or, you know, or like when I was in China and we work with those four to six year olds, we would have to develop like a story or like a, you know crocodiles and ducks, and like basically you have the defenders where the crocodiles and you know the ducks were trying to, to cross the river, so they would be wanted to put the balls from one side of the field to another, and they had to pull flags or whatever. And as you say, being creative, even for the for the older guys, if they're having fun, right? And, you know, they want to enjoy the practice. Like you have to kind of do that Jedi mind trick. Like yeah. you want to get the conditioning, you want to teach them the tackling. But if they know that it's okay, it's a bit competitive, and I can work against my body. And we can, you know, we can have a little bit of that, you know, either a shoulder battle or, or ass sumo or whatever you want to use or incorporate like, or, or just play casual soccer or what's the, what's the name, ultimate football, right? Yeah. Like if they're having that fun, they will be more inclined to come back. Like, as you say, it's a different environment, it's a different, it's, as you say, it's a different motivation for whether it's youth players in Europe versus, you know, you you for high school players in the States. Yeah. I think I'm jumping right there just because we're talking States in Europe, but you know, like, in the United States, a six to 10 year old, you're playing games. You're just trying to get them interested, keep them excited. By the time a kid is 10 in the States, they know if they like football or not. And then at that point, obviously you can do different things, but here in Europe, it's a, it's a totally different deal. You got to keep those kids engaged because you're dealing with teenagers. And I mean, they got a lot of other things they could do. First of all, girls, as a, as a man, <laughs> I guess we're just talking boys here too. Sorry, ladies. But girls will ruin a man, a teenager especially. And we all were there. Like, you find out all of a sudden your hormones are kicking. And you're like, do I go and hang out with this chick who might let me do something I've never done in my life? Who knows what that is? Or do I go to this practice and play this sport where they want me to run and just run and lift weights? And it, I mean, <laughs> but if it's something fun and you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to be hanging out with my friends. It's usually a cool game or something. And I can see that chick later. I mean, you got to get that confidence first, young fellas. But it, that's you're right that you got to make it fun for the kids. And I, I think that when we're talking about youth sports, that's everything. You know, you always have to make it fun for kids so that they will stay engaged. But we'll um, we'll try to move on now since we're talking about it. You know, let's get into the professionals when it comes to professionals. No, well, not professionals. Sorry. I don't know why I said professionals, adults and professionals. And we'll stick to Europe. There's no point in even trying to talk about all the, you know, college and NFL. Like we'll stick to European football, you know, club teams, your men's teams. 
when it comes to tackling, obviously, if you have new players, that's an individual situation. Everyone's different as an adult coming from other sports or coming from no sports. Teaching tackling to those players, that's something that coaches have to figure out. And there's a lot of different ways. I don't want to waste too much time talking about it. But these players who have played before, who are now playing on the men's team, and you get in these game situations and you watch these guys just, and I'm going to say it here in Finland, miss so many damn tackles. And I'm not talking about missing open field against skilled players. Like, that happens. If a dude got seven yards of space, you shouldn't be able to tackle. Like, that's just football. Like, a good football player should be able to make someone miss seven yards. But we're seeing guys in the hole, in the box, three yards here, two yards back, and they're missing the tackle. Or they're making contact and not finishing the tackle. And you're wondering, like, okay, is that is the, the ball carrier that good or is the defender that bad? Me talking specifically here in Finland in the past year had some of the best defensive linemen we've seen in the past couple of years. Like we were making the, an all Finland list and we're like, how do we even trim it down? Every team had three good defensive linemen. And then we're like linebackers, nobody, because they were all, that's what was happening was if people got past the first level, which was hard for most teams, these guys at the second level. And even, you know, safeties and cornerbacks, I mean, we're not going to talk too much about them. They're not making tackles that are tackles they should be able to make. It's not a lot of space. People aren't wide open and they're missing tackles. And it's not even a lot of times of, you know, they don't know the angle. When it comes to adults, usually the player is there. They just miss the actual tackle. It's not it's not the angles like we're talking with kids where they don't know where to go or they don't get there in time. It's literally they get there, they make contact, and that's it. And this goes into the which technique should you use. You got guys who they think they're bigger than they are, so they tackle up high, they tackle shoulders, and then they don't wrap up. You got guys who they can bring contact because they're using their helmet and shoulder pads, but there's nothing. they don't bring their legs, so they don't finish anything. They only can tackle people that are smaller than them. And then you got other guys who they go in there, turn their shoulder and hope to, to God that that's enough to make the tackle. And then wonder why after two seasons, their shoulder is dislocated and doesn't work right. So, I you mean, know, yeah, go ahead. You know, <laughs> go ahead. You, know you, you put you put a lot of those reasons for missed tackles, you know, those, whether it's contact angle, you know, as you mm -hmm. say, like, if you, like, if you imagine that, that, that clock face and like you, you're like between that 11 through, through one or, or to two o'clock, like you, you're in that positive angle, you should be able to make it right. Like, mm -hmm. that's why I think having that systematic approach and I've been using with the shoulder led tackling based on leverage, because that's the generic term Yeah. and having that, you know, we're not talking about particular brand of tackle like that. Okay. You tracked it in your hip, then you match it. So if I'm like left with my left, where's the head? As you say, I strike that with that shoulder punch Then I want to, you know, have that arm clamp, grab my wrist, you know, and then drive my legs, you know, having the systematic approach. And as you say, being able to watch your, your, your film and pinpoint those reasons for missed tackles, however you want to, you want to call it, whether it's arm clamp or, or lack of leg drive or, okay, player, you know, didn't run through the contact. You know, you got to, like, at Abus, for example, we use at least the three games to, to set that base. And a couple of my last stops, I'll go through the whole season, you know, then I would find those plays and make cut-ups, and then I would say, okay, we introduced a certain drill to fix this, or this is a technique that we use because in that game, this happened, right? And as you say, there are, this is the safety things that we discussed, like, either of the guys who haven't tackled before, or whether we say, hey, your spine in line, or you don't want to strike with the crown of your helmet, or you know, you don't want to dive into a guy and pray to God that you may, you know, he may trip over. And then there's the performance. Yeah. So you want to finish that drive to knock him back on that fourth and, and one or, or on that goal line. Right. So it, it takes a bit and, and we're probably opening uh, the proverbial Pandora's box now. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to teach that coach, you know, or to look at the film through this lens and kind of try to pinpoint those reasons for missed tackles. And then, as you say, being prescriptive to design certain drills to fix those specific problems. Because as you say, whoever missed the tackle is going to hit the donkey dick or the one man sled. Like, yeah, if my player missed the tackle because he takes a poor angle or he doesn't, you know, bring the, I don't know, he strikes with the incorrect shoulder, like hitting a one man sled is not going to help. That's, that's like the receivers who drop a pass and then do five push-ups. Explain to me how a push-up is going to make you a better pass catcher. It doesn't. Just something people learned from a very long time ago and refused to let go. You got to just let that type stuff go. I mean, jumping back into the whole, like, tackling, 
Me, I'm more of an anecdotal analyst, so obviously I'm not going to get into the X's and O's of how to teach someone how to tackle, but I do want to put out there that defensive coaches and position coaches, they try to put players in the right position. Like That's a coach's job is to make sure that when a play happens, you're in the right position. If a player is in the right position and they can't make the tackle, that's when a coach has to become a coach. I feel, especially, again, everything goes back to me, where I'm from, what I'm talking about, Finland, and I feel like a lot of times when teams aren't making tackles, instead of doing what you said, Wojciech, and, you know, looking at that, fixing that, going into practices and getting back to tackling, especially in season, coaches are like, well, let's come up with a new scheme of how we can do this and get a player. Here. No, get better at tackling. You can still do that during the season. That's not an off-season only thing. You can work on tackling during the season because a lot of times, and I feel bad for like coaches and coordinators who have to take the, the rap for, oh, well, they gave up this many yards. Well, they had them at the line of scrimmage. They had them behind the line of scrimmage, but the guy can't tackle, so they gained 50 yards, and now you're saying the defense is bad. Mm -hmm. Is the defense bad, or is this player not able to tackle? It's whether you, whether you agree with it or not, it's like, you know, you give players the fame, we take the blame. So as you say, yeah. start of being, like being uh, able to finish the tackle, it's a, it's a skill. It's, it's, it's as a skill. you say, yeah. getting in that position is one thing, but then, you know, everybody's pushing the, ga the gang tackle, but you want to be, you know, speed is great, accuracy is final, as Wyatt, Wyatt Earp said. It's like, <laughs> can you win that one-on-one -on -one battle? Like, yeah. or, you know, as you say, that's the, the, you know, being able to do that, like you need to have that confidence. So now we're, we're reverse engineering. Do yeah. we work on that in practice? Yes, like, that's know, exactly like, it. As you say, if I have an, my American running back, or if I will be going, uh, like, against you, and we don't have to go live, to the ground, we may work on doing a competitive tracking drill. Or, for example, like we have the one drill um, when you're corner, so we start already pre-engaged. So let's just say me. So I'm 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 already striking with my right shoulder, and now we're working on the on the leg drive. So you, you like there's one yard one yard drive. You what you want to score? I want to like knock you back, right? And it's a high force, low low impact drill. Or for example, as you say, we have the the crash mats, we have the shields, like. I think I send you those rugby drills. Those yeah, guys yeah. go to the ground, even on game day. Like, I, I saw one of my guys, you know, Andy Ryan, he posted the, uh, I think it was Patriots DBs working in the, in the game against Raiders. So they just, they would be just fitting off and just jumping up. And then you put that against the rugby guys who do their pregame warm up to where they go control to ground tempo. So we have a predetermined winner. We know it's a defensive drill, but I still, I strike you through the bag. And as you say, you're learning how to fall. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to work to the ground in some shape, form, or fashion. Like, I don't want to smash you 100%, but if I don't work on finishing the tackle, how am I supposed to perform it on game day? Or if, like, if it, would you, like, let's just say you prefer, you're preparing for combine. If you're not hitting the gym and doing those bench reps, now you got to go in and execute it for your, for your pro day, and you're going to suck at it. Like, if yeah. you're not, if, or, or if, let's just say we did the um, um, study in Arab, it's like two-thirds of our tackles, come from that negative angle. So for us would be if we if you feel familiar with that clock face, would be mm -hmm. from two, from two, from two to four, two and to then four. From, from four to six, or or vice versa would be like from ten to um to, to eight. And oh, now wow. in, in practice, we work only on that positive angle and it's one third of those tackles. How you expect me to work with that? Or you know, we're not even talking about those specific situations like engage tackle where I'm still being held by the blocker. And I have only half of my body. And like, think if you think about this type of tackle, you you think, okay, I gotta work on my on that or my D line, right? Who's gonna who's gonna you know facing that? Well, what about the DBs when they go against the Millennial Oklahoma on the bubble screen? The they bubble screen. That's what I was thinking exactly. I'm a defensive back. Or, or, or the ankle tab, right? When you're chasing a guy into last last ditch effort, like okay, I'm not gonna like you know kill a kid who who who, who makes the tackle and misses. But it's like if you're able to make the tackle, then we have a chance to line up and play another down. Or can you tackle? As you say, you, you enter that hole and, okay, I see a guy. I want to tackle him through the numbers. He goes lower. What do I do? I got I to gotta get lower in my pad level. That's like a very common mistake that we face, the dynamic pad level. Or I'm in an open space. I start a collision early. I just launch the guy. What's going to do? He's going to hurdle me. So you, you have to, there's like multiple tackle types, angles, finishes right whether you want to drive those legs whether you want to roll tackle and a lot of people have misconception that when you make a rugby tackle you have to roll like i would say the most common and and and, and that's 
Just you know, bring see. your legs. If you bring your legs, everything else works out. I'm sorry. I mean, obviously, no, I'm not getting into the coaching. Say, you, you said it best. It's drive your feet when you can. If the guy's pulling away from you, he's running away. Then you roll. You roll, roll yeah. when you must. Because when you're driving your legs, legs are the most powerful muscles you have. Or mm -hmm. those you know, situational finishes with this who can lift, right? Yeah, your leverage. Offense. I found that great tackle from that championship, from ELF game, from not this year, but last year, when they tied in that Botella Moran, there's the guy who actually hooks and lifts him, right? Mm -hmm. In like beautiful, beautiful way, like technique was perfect. Like, and that's like, okay, I'm gonna, of course I made a little cut up there and then this stays for, uh, for, for teaching purposes. But as you say, the better the athlete who has a voice in it, he's gonna make you look bad. And, yeah. and that's, that's what he's paid to do. But that's yeah. what, that's now to flip it, that's what we are, paid to do or that's that's our job to prepare our players to give them those tools in the toolbox for them to be able to to um to, to win those uh, those battles or to have a fighting chance i'm gonna say i would say one last thing before we move on about it is this is something that kind of is good and bad for depending on what side of the coin you are <laughs> is that a coach can come up with a good plan and and practice you know oh we're going to stop the offense because we can do this but then we can't actually tackle the guy so what are we going to do and then offensively, and again, I know we're talking tackling, but running backs make their money from breaking tackles. And if you're practicing and you never break a tackle, how are you going to know how good your running back is or your running game is? Because look at look at professional in college, just to look, not to use, but you will watch games where guys are consistently breaking that first tackle, and that's how their offense is able to you know go down the field. And then you look at other teams where the guy isn't breaking a tackle. And what the announcers always say, you know, oh, this guy is a great running back because he's making that first guy miss. And this other guy, well, he's just not getting anything done. But someone on that coaching staff knew in practice what was going to happen. And you'll see the play call in, you know, reflect that. While here in Europe, we have a lot of defensive teams where the play calling doesn't match the skill on the field. And that to me, is a direct correlation of them not knowing if they're going to be able to finish those tackles, like you said. Like me personally, as a coach, from a coaching standpoint, if I know that my linebackers aren't good at one-on-one -on -one tackles, I'm scheming to make sure there's always two people to the ball. I'm scheming ways to mess up things so that I don't have to rely on my one linebacker to make that tackle. But if I think that he can make the tackle and we go in there and then he misses the tackle, obviously – I was underestimated. Now, obviously, you can miss a tackle here and there, but we're talking about consistently, you know, watching teams miss multiple tackles. When when I see a guy make three guys on a defense miss, and I'm not talking about jukes in air, I'm talking about legitimately they're on him and let go somehow, that tells me your team doesn't practice tackling. And that's just what, what we have to get away from, which is why now I'm going to ask you, Wojciech, to tell us some of the solutions to these cap tackling issues, like a little more general than the actual, like what to do, but what are some ways teams, like someone listening to this who just needs to get in the right mindset of how can I make my team better at tackling on a consistent basis? What are some ideas that you would have? Well, you can uh, <laughs> send them my uh, email address and my Twitter handle. <laughs> yeah. I would say. Okay. Hold on. Let me, let me jump in here too. Uh, just exactly what Wojciech just said. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, when you talk about Pete Carroll, what did Pete Carroll do to make his team better? He went and found a rugby coach, right? He went and found help. That's what great coaches do. That's another thing I just want to throw out well, there to yeah, anybody. Yeah, but, but, but one thing to that, and I think, and this comes from one of the great contact and collision um, coaches in, that is on, on the world, like Richie Gray, who said, at the end of the day, football is football. And rugby is rugby. And, th and that mm -hmm. guy has consulted multiple teams, especially Miami Dolphins and top rugby teams, etc. Like, in rugby, you're not allowed to block. Mm -hmm. And, like, in football, you have 10 other guys who are actively paid to block all the other defensive guys from getting to the ball carrier, right? Mm -hmm. So, as you say, developing the coach's eye and having understanding, why did my players miss tackle? Yeah. Like, whether you educate yourself, you know, whether you're going to, you know, sign up to to, to our Adibus library or whether you want to go the resource use the resources from USA football. You know, there are there are other other clinic, you know, they will show you the drills. But knowing which drill to use to solve which problem, that's the that, that that's where the, that's where the essence is, right? Then as you say, you bring those drills and then you gotta you gotta sell it to your players. And I think that's where actually having those cut ups from last year, that's 
You know, when I was with the Jets, you know, we were able to improve our tackling by 48% from year to year. Or when I was with the Razorbacks, you know, we, we improved that year to year by 60%. Did it translate to winning more games? Uh, you know, but we had we had a chance as a defense to do our job and to limit those explosive plays because, like as you say, it doesn't matter what scheme I'm running if all you have to do is just throw that bubble bubble screen to a receiver and then he takes it 60 yards to the crib. It freaking doesn't matter if I have you know. It, it always pisses me off when when I see like some of the youth coaches and they have like 25 blitzes. It's, it's I don't know it's U15 or U16 or you know 17 fronts and 15 coverages and they because they don't know how to tackle like in a safe manner or, you know, how to, they don't have those fundamentals. Yeah. Because if you don't have those, like if you have, you have good fundamentals and, you know, some coaches, okay, now you're going to be my stand-up, you know, defensive end like Van Miller type or, you know, okay, we're moving to 4-3. You're going to be playing like a classical, you know, five-tech defensive end. He's going to find a place for you. But in a modern game, if you don't know how to make a tackle, well, we haven't even talk, talked about, players making business decisions because that happens as well. I have guys, uh, you know, I get there, but I I don't want to have any, anything at the same time. You don't have to always make the fucking sorry, Pardon my French. No, you're fine. Like this, have to make that, you know, knockout hit because that's the difference. There's a difference between being a hitter and being a great tackler. Like if you bring your hands and sometimes you bring him, bring the guy to the ground. Okay. We, we line up and play another down. And this comes also from analytics. If an average offensive drive in, in division in Division One football is six plays, or for me last year I think it was five point one plays per drive. What does it tells me is that the, the offense has to have, have hit a big play, or you know they have five to six plays to score on us. So if we make those, if we have a high tackling efficiency, and instead of ha- them being in second and six, they are in second and eight or, or third and eight, or, or instead of third and four, that, that's where the, that we have a fighting chance. Yeah, it's right? a trickle down effect, yeah. You know, we, we're trying to, you know, scheme things, but on the other hand, there is a guy who's being paid to beat what you're doing schematically. And as you say, we, we, all, we, we all preach that gang tackling and swarming to the ball, and that's the other thing, is that, for example, do we have to work on swarming drills, or I hate pursuit drills, if we're having seven on seven, for example. Because if you think about it, like if you have seven on seven, this is your pursuit period. Or if you if you run scout defense, you may run a different scheme, but you can work your fundamentals through that scheme, right? So it's also like idea about practice planning and being efficient and designing those complementary practices to where those segments, you know, that they actually, you know, you, you're not working on the same skill twice, or or you actually trying to uh, cover all the all the proverbial bases, yeah. right? So that that would be the other thing. Then, as you say, there is the whole winter long offseason to where, you know, you can introduce those players to some of those grappling games, to some of those, you know, one-on-one tracking games where they don't need to even, like, it's similar to maybe a tag game. Like, they don't, they can do it on, on their own. Like, if they go, like, to the field with, like, few of them, what else? It's, again, it's it's easier said than done. And yeah, of course, mean, yeah. Right? Because we may say, okay, just uh, Paul Coach Wojcik is going to fix your, your tackling. You know, that was, you know, you said it earlier about this mid-season adjustment, which is true, but I, I think I can say a few things. So earlier this year, we did a project for the Panthers. I think it was like after week two. So we actually take a look at their tackling and, you know, we suggested some solutions. They wanted to focus on, on you know, on the on the offensive side of the ball. And you see it in the, in the NFL, those couple tackles may be a difference between a team winning a game and, and coach, you know, saving his job. We did, we did, we did a project for Colorado. But if you think about it, like if you're in like mid-season and we say, okay, like we've been teaching you how to tackle and, you know, bring your head across. Now with week two, I'm going to say, you know what? All the stuff we've been talking about since January, we're throwing it out. We're just now we are like rugby tackling. So whenever you are, you bring your near foot and your shoulder tackle. Like you're going to confuse your players. So that yep. in, in the European context, yes, you may have, okay, you know, I don't want you to have the flat hands. You want to grab your wrist and have a clamp. But like realistically, how much time in the week to week basis you have to fix those. As you said, early in the season when you haven't tackled that, you know, those um either um um head helmet to helmet collision, missed tackles, they are high because you haven't been working on it. Then you know you have this you get into the game shape, but then there is a whole level of fatigue. You know, then you know you just say, okay, on Tuesday it's, it's a lighter day, but then on Thursday we gotta be able to you know work some of that ground contact or, or shields and you know use those mats to actually replicate that you know game day intensity. Because yeah, you know, we, I, we I'm gonna jump that. in there. I I think just because we're about to have to wrap it up, but obviously your your general idea for the solutions we have to focus on what we can 
improve in our tackling throughout the season. You can't just do it in the offseason at one block period. And during the season, you can't be afraid to do live tackling just because you're in season and afraid of injuries or concerned about injuries. Injury prevention can be done, but you have to tackle. It has to be something. And that's something that you can see as, as well. Like maybe teams practice it really well up to the season and teams' defenses are making a lot of good tackles early in the season. And then later as the season goes on, all of all of a sudden they're missing those same tackles because they're not focusing on it. They're focusing on who we're playing, what scheme we're doing. And you always revert back to what you know. You always revert back to what you know. And if you haven't been doing something consistently, you're going to revert back to whatever you knew before. And if that's nothing, then it's you don't you don't finish plays. And if that's uh, when I was a little kid, they taught me, even if you can't make the tackle, throw your hands out there and grab something. So if I'm tired and I'm not making a tackle, I'm going to throw my hands out there out of just, you know, muscle memory. And I might make a tackle that I might not have made earlier, but that's a, that's a good thing I've been taught. So it's something that can help me, but it's consistent. And that's what we need to do with the coaching is just be more consistent about tackling. I think that's it. That's the sentence. That's it. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and and I know what we talked about, like about 45 minutes and it's just, just an introduction, you know, like, as you say, uh, finding and, and monitoring this like that's why for, for us we always had a week to week you know monitoring okay what was our tackling efficiencies how many tackles we made how many we missed what, how many yaks we, we we gave up and i know it may be extra half an hour maybe an hour like if you have a staff it would be good to have a person who's responsible so there was some consistency in it but tracking that on a week to week basis and then having that designing that practice from mm-hmm. you know okay let's let's say tuesday we correct the mistakes Let's just say Tuesday, and let, let's just use the examples. Okay, if we play an air raid team one week and we play a triple option team the other week, then you know the challenges in tackling may be a little different, whether it's closing space in the open open space. And now working those close quarter battles, you know, dealing with a blocker. But of course, I'm not gonna say that there are generic offenses in Europe, but it's like being able being prescriptive in practice. And I know I've mm-hmm. been saying this a lot, but like how we did in, in an out of us, we we're able to provide an individualized practice plan. We could even break it down to that level. I know that it's in Europe. If you're even able to um, do that on a positional group, so it's okay. So for our linebackers, the, yeah. the idea, the reason for missed tackles was this. For our DBs was this. For our D-line was this. And heading into this week, okay, we may be potentially, this may happen, blah, blah, blah. blah. We may put like a one or two drills that deal with that or in pre-practice or whatever. That's gonna just you know reap the benefits, but I think it's it's a discussion worth having, and you know um, you know if some coaches want to hit me up. You know I, I I did some clinics for for coaches in in Denmark um, from you know in in in, in, um, in Germany etc. So if some Finnish coaches would love to would love to talk talk about that, I'll I'll love to and share that, some knowledge. You know. Yeah, and that's anyone that's listening as well. You know these this podcast we're I'm making it up as I go, but we're hitting topics that are important to me as well as about the the European football community. And this is something that I've talked on another show. I don't know if it's going before or after this one, but coaches, players, enthusiasts, the internet is open now, right? Like let's connect, let's reach out to each other. Let's communicate. You have any ideas? Wojciech is here. Uh, Perfect purpose at perfect purpose on any social media, perfect purpose at gmail.com. I connect people with other people. Um, that's just something I do on a regular basis. People send me messages, ask to talk to someone. I connect them. They become best friends. And later on, I see them later in life. Uh, Wojciech's one of my guys. At, at, Coach Voigt, at Coach Voigt, you know, on, on, on all the platforms. And as you say, one thing we haven't hit, and I think it may be, we may have touched base on it. Like the idea for, for teaching the safer techniques or teaching what's best in the market is also that safety factor that those parents who want to sign up that kid and mow my little Johannes because they may have seen concussion with Bruce Smith, or they probably heard so about it. Biggest thing why parents don't sign right? up their kids is because and they're afraid of getting hurt. My little Johan is going to play American football, he's going to get paralyzed and he's going to break his neck. And you say, hey, we teaching with this ter- terminology provided by the you know authorities. Because in Europe, we don't have that mandatory certification. Or I don't they know. Should, they should make heads up. Um, mandatory in Europe. Uh, that's just an idea. It should be mandatory for all youth coaches. I know adults is different, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to get too much into it, but the youth is how you build the sport, and yeah. kids aren't being, kids don't want to play because they don't know anything about the sport, and parents won't let them play because they think it's too dangerous. 
and informing them, the best way to inform them is to be certified in the safety of the sport, especially when it comes to tackling. And you can get USA football heads up um, certification online nowadays. You get yeah. when you watch some videos so that you know you have the the technical knowledge, but also federations can have there be a mandatory, you know, coaching clinic that you have to do this to coach youth. And I think that's a one big issue is that youth coaches need to be certified to coach American football, just like other sports. I don't I don't know all the countries in Europe. I know here in Finland, if you're coaching youth basketball, you have to have a certain level of coaching to coach youth basketball. So American football is a very dangerous sport in terms of knowledge and physicality. If you don't know what to do, you're going to get hurt. Like, that's just the way it is. So and as coach- you say, like, there was, the, there was the ego aspect to where, like, so you have a guy who played football for 30 years and now he's going to transition to coaches, okay, because I was told, like, this way, I'm going to teach it this way. No, the sport is evolving. And, like, you know, I, I think one of the comments, you know, under your articles were, oh, tackling is not the, like, leading leading cause of concussions. Whether you read, the, you read the articles and, like, point blank is that tackling, it's, like, leads to, like, a lot of helmet-to-helmet collisions and that leads to, you know, concussions. Bad tackling. They, don't, they keep forgetting to put in there bad tackling is what happens. And that's one of those other things, just talking about old head coaches, guys, it is 2023 now. The 1990s was 30 years ago. So just remember that when you, some of you mid 20s and even mid 30 guys are like, oh, well, I'm teaching a new wave because, you know, I'm teaching stuff from like the 90s and 2000s. That's still old. Well, if like, you think it, about it, some people are thinking, oh, well, for 80s and 70s, 80s, 70s, yeah, that's hella old. But the 90s was a long time ago. Hey. 2010s, the stuff that we were I find, I find some of my practice videos from 2012 and actually I was I was I was teaching tackling and it seeing myself coaching a decade ago would make me cringe and this yeah. what it should be because that shows you're evolving. You know, we as have to say, evolve. Even that, that Pete Carroll video we talked about with Rocky said it was 2014. It's almost a decade ago. And if yeah. you, you teach you talk to rugby guys, this was an introductory level of rugby tackling into football like they've there have been several layers to that you know for example usa football system and whether it's arabus also you know like that stuff is evolving because there's okay and as you say it's working on those scenarios and, and designing the drills whether it's at the basic level it's okay technique so i'm just you know kneeling from from you know one one step now or now it's a decision making so you know a ball carrier has a limited options he can go left he can go right i react with movement and then you go to a game-based drill, whether, okay, now is a, like a limited space, limited box, but who can actively juke me? He can make moves, right? Or, you know, whether we say it's a predetermined drill with, a, you know, limited to the ground, right? So yeah. I know that the defense wins. I want to give them, you know, one or two moves or whether it's live-live. You don't have to go live-live bone-on-bone. You may use bags. You may use mats. So instead of having one, let's just say, bone-on-bone rep, you may have four or five, you know, shield and bag rep. And it's, I think it's managing the load. It, it's something that it's, it improves your odds. Yes, yeah. there's nothing that can, can be a substitute for the in-game reps. But as you say, like, you want to mimic those game day conditions. And you want to you want to work on as many scenarios with your players as possible, and you want to give them tools. Yes, like, give them tools. You want to give them, you want to teach them how to strike with left shoulder, right shoulder, multiple levels. Think about this scenario when you're the second tackler, okay, and you see a guy goes high, so you, now we got to go low, or vice versa, right? I know yeah. that's like we may talk about for the next three hours. Yeah, I was gonna say we're we're getting into it now, but um, I'm I'm gonna wrap it up. I I think that we we really stretch this about the different aspects and what can be done. And it really just comes down to, we got to continue talking about it. This is a topic. We might just start a series called tackling and football episode two, part three, part four, part five. We might just continue this on because I feel like there's still a lot to talk about. And now once people hear this, they're going to also want to talk. So we'll continue this conversation. Uh, me and Wojciech, you can find us on our socials that I'll put all that on the episode and stuff too. But I appreciate you coming on, man. And this was a great conversation. And I wish we could keep talking, obviously. So we're going to have more episodes. We talk more about this or different topics as well. I'll have you back on here 
and we'll keep this going. But any last thing you want to say to anybody on here? Before? Oh, hey, I, I appreciate you having me. As you say, it's great that we um, start the conversation. Uh, one thing I would say is that we should, um, in general, in Europe, share those information, share that experiences, and, and not be protective because, like, in the grander scheme of things, you know, when the those the rising tide, you know, the, goes up, the oboes go 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 up. And I think, like, we should, you know, share those and have those conversations. Sometimes yes. maybe okay. Why do you teach those players? Or I think it's better. And, you know, convince me. And, you know, and we can learn. And, and you know, we haven't invented it. But also people who, who teach in the States, they haven't invented it. They stole from somebody else. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in our, you know, it's copycat of- league. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. This is what it is. So, thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation. And, hey, guys, have a, have a great year, 2023. All right, guys. And that's it for the offseason. Um, I'm Perfect Purvis. Keep rocking with me. We'll see you next time.